Radio. Talk Radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life. From Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at UBNRadio.com. She's passionate about telling stories of amazing women who are rocking the world and empowering women to live, love, and thrive. Here's your host, Katherine Gray. Hi, welcome to Live, Love, Thrive, Women's Empowerment Hour, brought to you by 360karma.com. I am fortunate to have on a very funny lady today, Miss Dana Goldberg, who is a professional comedian. And then later in the show, we're going to be talking with uh, Patsy Moore, who is an award-winning recording artist and poet. In fact, we're going to be giving away one of uh, Patsy's books. So the first person that makes a comment on Facebook Live will win that copy of the book, and we'll talk to her later. First up, please give a warm welcome to Dana Goldberg. Good morning. Good morning. Or afternoon. Yeah. Happy International Women's Day. To you as well Yay. and everyone out there watching and listening. That's right. That's right. Rock on. I uh, wore my red today. Look at you. Love. I did not. And I didn't wear my blazer. Oh, that wasn't to show you up. <laughs> right. It's always to show up. I didn't wear my you're, blazer so people could tell us you apart. Could, you're blushing, so. It's, it doesn't take much. <laughs> but uh, that's exciting that we actually have an International Women's Day to recognize this. I you think know. right now more important than ever. More than ever. Yes. More than ever. So I think a lot of people today are like taking off work. They're marching downtown. They, I keep missing yeah. the marches in L.A. Either I'm out of, for the Women's March I was in Portland so I marched in Portland yeah. and then today I get to spend the afternoon with you which yeah. is yeah. just as good yeah. I feel like we're mar- we're marching under the table you all can't see it but our legs are marching that's we're right marching. that's right don't yeah don't tell what's going on under the table oh sorry <laughs> I actually have no pants on I have no pants on she said it was radio and it's from like here up you gotta join pantsuit nation <laughs> well I can only join suit nation <laughs> that's right <laughs> pants on. that's right. right so uh, I know a lot of people probably don't know your humble beginnings of how this fantastic oh career in comedy started my humble beginnings started um i did a stand-up set when i was in high school and i was a senior yeah. uh, 17 and i won yeah. which was interesting this was a um, high school talent show, high school right? talent show. i was it, telling jokes about my boyfriends and why it wasn't working out and like <laughs> who teachers knew? who knew apparently no wonder some it was so funny knew. no kidding i actually digitized the tape so i found the tape and i put it on my first dvd i love it we put it in the machine and i was working with some guy digitizing it and we both went <laughs> and I said I didn't know I was gay yet and he goes you couldn't have been I was wearing a pair of jeans a button down and a tie I look like Paula Poundstone <laughs> and it had polar bears on it the, the tie did and the guy was like I don't think you could look gayer unless you were wearing a softball uh, glove and a visor and oh I was that's like, funny mm, yeah pretty much yeah I used to wear a blazer and a bow tie before I knew and it was I'm glad you got rid of the bow tie <laughs> <laughs> me too thanks for Ooh, can't I tell know it there's all a now. visual <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so this high school uh, talent show came yeah. up, and you were thinking, "I think I'll do comedy." Like, how how did that happen? I think uh, just well, I think comedy picked me first. Yeah. And the other thing is, is like my kindergarten teacher told my mother I was the funniest five year old she'd ever met. I don't know who my competition was, but apparently <laughs> I was blowing it away uh, when I was five. Um, I think I've just used humor through my life to get through some hard times and right. to uncomfortable situations, and it's right. just something like that I one? do, no. like <laughs> this one. So, yeah. <laughs> A joke should start any minute. Um, no pressure. And so I was like, you know, this is always. It, I, I used to listen to tapes. I used to listen to um, Comic Relief, Billy Crystal, Robin Williams. Um, when you were four? No. Well, when I was. <laughs> well, when I was in high school. Yeah. And so I was. I don't think I realized I was actually studying because I'm listening wow, cool. to all of these tapes and yeah. I'm learning it. The guy, the MC at the at the talent show, yeah. introduces me, and I was like, "Give it up for the MC!" Like I had done it a thousand times. <laughs> So that's basically how it started. And then I didn't touch a stage for about eight years. I, I got my degree in physical education mm-hmm. because I'm a <laughs> lesbian and it's the law in New Mexico. Um, and then I... Uh, yeah, otherwise they'll pull your membership. They will. Yeah, I'll lose my will. card. <laughs> so uh, in high school, yes, you did this uh, talent show. You brought down the house. Brought down you won the house. first place. I did. Okay. It's first time and I got paid for comedy. And then you thought, hey, maybe, maybe this is a career? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, I was. It was always in the back of my head. Right. And I. I wanted. You know. I went to the university. I got my right. degree. And then I was bartending. And it kept 
but it kept bugging me and resurfacing and yeah. then I had there's a show that used to come through Albuquerque which is where I'm from and mm -hmm. it was called Funny Lesbians for a Change and it raised higher education scholarships for women in the community uh -huh. and I remember one year going to listen to one of my now colleagues perform Suzanne right. Westenhofer oh yeah I love her and uh, she hit this joke and it, the laughter she got I was like I want to know what that feels like right right I want to know what that feels like yeah. so um, and when I was 26 so 2000 and so you stole um, her joke no, I'm just I stole her joke. <laughs> we never do that. It's bad. It's bad karma. Right. 360. It's, yeah. What that bad is. karma. Yeah. There's a there's a callback for you. Um, so uh, it, I went auditioned for the show that she had headlined years later, mm -hmm. um, and they gave me a seven minute set in front of 650. But wait a people. minute. Oh, I remember skipping. you telling yes. me that you went to audition oh, and you yes. actually were eight minutes late I was. the first time and they wouldn't let you do it so um yeah the story kind of i shared with story. you it is it's um i may tear up i don't know but um so i walked i had been uh dating a, 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 a wonderful woman for a short period of time that happened to be a pilot in the military mm -hmm. and the way for her to follow her dream the fastest way was to enlist and become a pilot she was one of the um first females to ever fly an mc-130 she was a powerhouse wow and so I had talked to her about this dream of wanting to get on stage, and she's like, you have to do it. Like, life is short. You have to do this. I'll mm -hmm. go with you. Mm -hmm. So I went into the audition, and I walked in five minutes late, and they said, you're going to have to wait till next year. Oh, my gosh. So I said, okay, I'm going to wait till next year. She and I stopped dating at that time. She would moved. Um, and uh, this, the hard part, obviously, the story is she was in a military exercise in Puerto Rico, and her plane hit a mountain, and she was killed. Oh, my God. So... It was one of those moments, and I think we've all had at least something not necessarily equal to that, but definitely a moment of waking up and going, what the hell am I doing? Why am I wasting time with my life? Right. What do I want to do with this? Right. There really are, like, if you think of your lifetime, there's usually, like, four or five, yeah. like, moments that really impact the course of your life. I absolutely agree. And that sounds like it was definitely it a was pivotal a one. It was a huge yeah. one. So after that, um, there, the audition came back around, and I decided I was going to go do it. I wrote a set, and I went, and, and I kind of went on her, be like in I, honor. Of it her, was definitely you said. Yeah. like I'm going to go do this. Yeah. This is going to happen. Yeah. Um, and basically, what happened was I went and auditioned in a little dive bar in Albuquerque in front of like four or five old lesbians, and there was, you could still smoke in there, and blah blah blah. <laughs> and I let, they're like, "We'll give you a five minute, you know, we'll give you a seven minute set." Uh, at the beginning of the show. So I wrote my material, Catherine, and I went and I practiced it in a lint brush was my microphone <laughs> with my sister and her very stoned friends and I was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. So whether it was real or not, my self-esteem was boosted and I was ready to do this. And then uh, the day of the show, they put me second because I was the new comedian. Oh my gosh. And I remember I was wearing a black shirt and I looked down and I can see my, I could see my heartbeat. Wow. And I could, my hands were shaking, so I didn't touch the microphone because I felt like I was going to turn it into like an amplifying vibrator, you know, that sort of thing where I was like, oh. Um, but I hit my first big joke, and in that sold-out theater, I heard the most deafening laughter I'd ever heard. And wow. I was like, what a high. Oh, this is what, I'm sure it's what yeah. being on drugs feels like. I don't do them. I've never done them. Um, but it's, um, yeah. yeah, it was, the that's how it all started. High. It was amazing. I feel like I could high. fly. Yeah. Yeah. Seven minutes. Everything hit. People were coming up to me afterwards. Wait, do you asking, remember what that joke was? Oh, God, yes. Okay. Okay. So basically, and it's always awkward telling a joke when I'm not on stage, but um, I'm also going to take off my bracelets because it's, it's, it's making noise. Why not? You don't um, have any pants on. Yeah, I don't have any pants on. We're just going to keep that there. Um, so basically, the, the joke was, you know, I, I'm out. My best friend was not. Yeah. And uh, she said, Dane, if anything ever happened to me, can you get rid of my journals and that gap bag that's under my bed? <laughs> so you got to remember this. It's like 1994 when we were in high school. Right. So Gap sponsors a lot of things in the gay and lesbian community. I'm pretty sure they're not the hiding place for sex toys. <laughs> but wouldn't that be great if they were? Yeah. I mean, think about this Gap commercial, just some hot lesbian and some wrinkle-free khakis <laughs> holding a huge vibrator. And it's like dancing the 60s swing mu music. It's like new wrinkle-free khakis in the Turbo 1600. And then right below it, it'll just have a little caption that says, from our Gap to yours. <laughs> and the theater exploded. <laughs> That's good. That's and good. It was one of the first jokes I'd Still ever written. Still a good written. joke. Thank you. It was one of the first jokes I'd ever written. And then after that, it was, um, God, there was a, a joke about rainbow trout, uh, the bumper stickers we used to have on the back of our cars that uh -huh. said, like, I heart the rainbow flag. Mm -hmm. And my friend of mine put it right next to his Jesus fish. And so he said he was going to come out to his family. And I was like, what happened? He goes, uh, he congratulated me and bought me a fishing pole. And I was like, didn't you tell me you were gay? And he said, no, I told him it was a bumper sticker that says, I love rainbow trout. So... 
It was it was jokes that were written about like my friends and my family at the nothing time. Nothing is funnier and, than real life, right? Uh, no, nothing. Yeah. yeah, you gotta tweak it a little bit. Yeah. I often, I mean, I tell jokes about you know relationships on stage and people I've been involved with in my family, and I'll always tweak the joke enough that people don't know exactly who I'm speaking of or if right. it's in present time because right. I never, I'm not the comic that wants to tear people apart on right. stage. Right. And I want to protect the guilty. You know right. what I mean by changing their names <laughs> and things like that. So. Right. Yeah. I, I've heard your sets and they're always like this real life thing about when, you know, the people you've dated and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's very funny. Thank you, Catherine, yeah. very much. So um, I know you use this gift for good um, and you do things like HRC mm -hmm. and you put together a... Um, uh, a fundraiser in New Mexico, right, for, uh, for the AIDS, AIDS Foundation. Foundation. Yeah. yeah, which so, is really awesome. So um, I've got a show in Albuquerque on April 15th. It's called the Southwest Funny Fest, uh -huh. and it's in its 11th year. And so what I've done over the years is the AIDS Foundation. And you started this? I started this 11 wow. years ago in, in the same theater that I Oh, that I did my first set. Oh my gosh, this one you're telling us yes. about? Yes. Oh, wow. So the theater That's I started really my cool. career in, I've brought this back. So basically oh. what happened was that show kind of went defunct. Yeah. And the producers had moved to different places or they oh. broke up, as yeah. <laughs> lesbians do. And um, I decided, you know what, I know the community's here. I know yeah. they will come out for this. So I yeah. decided I was going to host each year, mm -hmm. do a small set, and bring in three of my headlining female comics from around the country. Oh, fabulous. So because it's all women. All women. And there was one year that we did an LGBT version, and I brought in an incredible funny male comedian named Jason Duty and a very trans a very funny trans comic named Ian Harvey I don't know mm -hmm. if you've ever met Ian but he's lovely uh, trans he was on transparent and things yeah. like that yeah long and short in our career and in my field men headline that's what happens it, it's rare that right. you will see more than one female on a bill yeah. much less a female headlining in a club it's gotten much right. better well there's two so. interesting things about what you're saying one is uh, have you been watching the uh, rise up so, I did. I saw the first one. Yeah. I have not seen the second two. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And one of the things is is about how the lesbian community came up to the plate when the AIDS crisis happened. Right. Um, and I know personally I went to so many fundraisers for that. And uh, so that's what I think, number one, is cool that you're having four female comedians raising money for the AIDS Foundation, which right. really is supportive of our male friends. Well, and uh, we're, all, we're all connected. And we're all touched yeah, by that. Right. Either we know someone that, one, it, you know, that has yeah. the virus or, you know, I did the AIDS ride. Mm -hmm. I'm from, I rode a bicycle from San Francisco to Los Angeles and broke my vagina is oh. basically what happened. <laughs> um, it's 545 you miles. The gap. <laughs> yeah, the gap ought to take care of that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's one of those things that I, I want to give back to the organizations and the people that support me. And, yes. and I have a, a ton of mainstream fans, straight mm -hmm. fans, if you will, and mm -hmm. allies and things like that. And, and my comedy, I think, and a lot of people would agree, funny is funny. Yes. And especially in this day and age, yes. the fact that I'm a lesbian becomes yeah. very secondary yeah. because it's less taboo than it used to be. Right. And, and also, too, you're Jewish. You like, talk yeah. about that. I That's, talk about that. Yeah. Now, your mom uh, <laughs> raised you yeah, she did. She, as a single mom, she right? Did. Yeah. So, um, and you were telling me like in high school, like it would be hard to imagine, but uh, that you were bullied. And, and so, so oh, many, God. so many listeners, I think, relate to that. So yeah. many kids didn't like high school or were bullied. And, and, you know, what is it that, why do you think you were bullied? You told me well, you were a tomboy, you were in the band. Definitely a tomboy. In I, was a, band. I was in marching band, <laughs> yeah. although I was section leader of the drum line. Yeah. So I was friends with the cheerleaders. Um, <laughs> this is the thing. Wait, so you are a Jewish lesbian nerd, basically? Well, well, yeah, it's, uh, Jew I know. Okay, now I get it. No. I, you, you don't understand why I was bullied? Let's let's spell this out for the listeners. Um, this is the thing, Catherine. When I was much younger, um, I had been bullied when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And then something happened. Because you were a tomboy? Because I was a tomboy. Yeah. I just didn't fit in. Yeah. Um, and then what had happened was, strangely enough, and this is hard for me to admit and talk about, but I think a lot of people will understand this. I became the bully for a long, a short period of time in, when I was in elementary school mm -hmm. around fourth or fifth grade because mm -hmm. I had all this hurt built up and I didn't know right. what to do with it. Right. And it was probably a way to protect yourself. And it was horrible. And I look yeah. back and I, I was lucky enough to have an opportunity 30 years later to apologize to this person oh, really? for just treating her badly. And, and what's interesting is the cycle of it is that I was picked on. 
I picked on someone else. It was very young. I was probably nine or ten. Yeah. And then that ended, and then I was basically picked on through middle school. High school, I started to get into my own stride. I was a mm-hmm. soccer player. I was the drum line. Mm-hmm. Like, I was the cool kid without being the cool kid. I was fr- right. Everyone was friends with me. I made them laugh. Right. People right. liked to be around me. But yeah. I wasn't the girl asked out to prom. Right. I wasn't homecoming queen. Right. Like, those sorts of things. Right. Although right. our homecoming queen was a big lesbian, which was awesome. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that you, you through did, the you years. Did, you weren't the homecoming queen. You just dated the homecoming right, queen. Right. <laughs> I would have liked to. I didn't know back then. And I think what happened is as I, as I moved into my career in my adulthood that I now want to help protect the communities that are being bullied. Right. And I have a voice. Mm-hmm. And if I can do that through humor and raise a lot of money through my comedy, right. then I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing right. during this lifetime. And, you know, and I uh, we started to talk about and I want to circle back to the fact that you you have uh, four headliners in your um, fundraiser uh, yeah. in in. Uh, Texas. Albuquerque. I mean, New Mexico. It's okay. Um, <laughs> wherever. It's all in the middle. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. you go. But uh, that you, that it is unusual to have, like you said, all female comedians for a show. Right. <clears throat> in fact, isn't it a really tough industry, as you could say this about any industry, but I would think exceptionally tough in comedy to be a woman. There is some very strange double standards um, when it comes to comedy. If guys are vulgar, they're allowed to be. They're funny. They're cool. If women are vulgar, why do they have to be so vulgar? Why can't you act like a lady on stage? We're not mm-hmm. allowed to talk about certain subjects. Mm-hmm. And we're also working, and usually we're working, if in a mainstream comedy club, we're following guys that are talking about rape, about misogyny, about... About, but see, I don't find that stuff funny. Right. And yeah, most most that. of us uh, that yeah. I feel like are a little more intelligent and have a little bit of higher, we don't necessarily find that humor right. funny. But in a comedy club, yeah. people are drunk and they're loving it. And then yeah. I have to go up as a female to follow this guy who's talking right. about, you know, dyke this or fag that. And I'm like, oh, my God, the fact that people still use this language. It's unbelievable. And, isn't they, it? and they think it's humorous. I think it's funny. Yeah. yeah. I don't find it funny. Yeah. I don't either. But I think that with with the, the show that I do, one of the things is that, you know, our my audience. I think what's is, funny is everyday life. Absolutely. Uh, family stories, relationship stories, what's going on. Uh, like we don't have to talk about uh, crime and, and right. things like that to make it. Uh, what, what is funny about that? I don't understand. Uh, this but is, everyday life. Right. Hilarious. And this is the thing yeah. about comedy, whether yeah. it's you or anyone else. The only reason I can make you laugh, Catherine, is because mm-hmm. you can see yourself mm-hmm. in my material right. or you can imagine it happening. Right. So I I create that bridge for people. I give them permission to laugh at things they wouldn't normally laugh at. Right. Or I connect dots with things that they are like, of course there's humor there. Right. Because right now, I mean, trust me, we could talk about a lot of shit that's going on that a lot of people are having a very hard time finding humor in. Right. I think we uh, the, polit- the, the political atmosphere, just life in general, crime. Well, personally, I don't hear anybody talking about politics. Never. I have. No, I don't even know who's in the office, White House. Who is that? I, yeah. I've, I mean, I haven't heard anything since the election. <laughs> it is tough, and we do need laughter. That's yeah. for sure. You're definitely in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Do you think it's getting better for women in comedy? Like, if somebody's oh, a listener and they're thinking, "I really would like to be doing that," what would you suggest to them? How do they get started? Well, like an open mic. Definitely. A and Mike, if you're living in a city that has a comedy club, go in there, bring people that love you and that are going to support you because it is mm-hmm. scary to get on stage for the first time. Right. So I, that's my opinion. Do Other you still comedians get will. Oh, every time. Yeah. But I also have learned through the years, it's been almost 14 years, that I feed those nerves into my show now. Right, right. And honestly, I think if I stop getting nervous, I have to question yeah. why I'm doing this. Right, right. Because it's almost that's kind of the it's, thrill it's of caring it. about yeah. it. Yeah. So, well, they say if you keep challenging yourself, it's what keeps life, it, it keeps you enthusiastic and keeps life exciting. Absolutely. The minute you don't, you feel complacent and, and, and like you're going through the motions, yeah. life isn't very interesting. So the fact that it still challenges you is a great thing. I love it. I mean, yeah. some of my colleagues that have been doing this for 20 years more than I have, they, I ask, they're, they're still nervous before shows. Yeah. I really think if someone's like, meh, whatever, it yeah. could go well or not, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Then you're like, what are you doing? Yeah. And anybody who's been a comedian knows that there are good days and bad days, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You good have... audiences and bad audiences. Oh, yeah. And trust me, there. Uh, yeah. one thing about comedians, and that we are sensitive human beings, yeah. and we are putting our heart and souls up on stage and very yeah, vulnerable. When it's very vulnerable position because it's immediate feedback there's mm-hmm. no camera there it's right. not a sitcom there's no television or third wall that you have that protection right. 
it's immediate feedback. Right. And so, yeah, it's Speaking pretty Speaking of pretty that, vulnerable. would you ever want to do a uh, sitcom? Oh, or? absolutely. You would. I would yeah. love to start a sitcom. I also would love to you know, have something like a daytime talk show, like an Ellen thing. Yeah. Eventually. And like, a, um, and a, how about an HBO comedy special? Oh, for sure. Yeah. HBO, I totally Netflix, see you Showtime. Doing that. Yeah. I did a logo special with Andrea Myerson, who yeah. you know quite well, uh -huh. um, but that was back in uh, 2009, so I think it's time. It is it's time. in the works. I'm, work I'm actually I have a meeting on Thursday yeah. um, with someone that I'm hoping will be able to pitch to one of all of the live streaming <clears throat> networks is now what's big. Yeah. Netflix, yes. you know, um, CISO, Hulu, all of that. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be pitching in the next month or so. So I'll keep you posted. So if it comes through, we'll. And you have a podcast in the works. Yep. Working yeah. on a radio show podcast. Um, hopefully it will be in conjunction with a major media platform. And then I'm very much going to have the human rights campaign involved. So wonderful. The, basically, I feel like right now there's um, not a lot of very quality shows out there other than yours. That <laughs> gives people a, an opportunity to mail. have. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. That gives people an opportunity to really um, hear the issues that they want to talk about and yeah. it's and, not and just have pop positive culture. positive yeah. i mean just give us positive absolutely you know, that's what i love about doing this is uh, there's so many for me so many amazing women doing incredible work in the world oh, let's yes. talk about it and, and most successful women like yourself are giving back and paying it forward and mm -hmm. i love talking about that so i appreciate what you're doing with your fundraiser Thank and you. also all the work that you do with hrc the Thank human you. rights campaign i know you're going to be featured at the la one on march 22nd march 18th oh march 18th so it's actually a week from okay. saturday march and 18th. um yeah they pull me in i have some strange gift of being able to do a live auction very very well yeah I've so heard i get that. up and i make them laugh uh for about five minutes and then i take all of their money yeah. Wait, uh, what's the craziest <laughs> thing you ever auctioned oh um uh, craziest yeah I don't know in this specific situation I if there's been a lot year, of crazy uh, stuff. We went to some uh, event and uh, they told us we won sperm and we're like, what? And they're like, you, you won <laughs> sperm from the cryobank and we donated it to the auction for the okay, uh, so there was a donation, LGBT center. There was a donation to a yeah. sperm bank that got redonated. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. I can't make this up. That's hilarious. And they didn't actually hand us the vial. They actually just oh, said well, you won this and... And so we paid it forward. And <laughs> I took my, my best friend. Uh, we She went and uh, had gotten um, uh, IVF done. So she had the big the s <laughs> frozen thing of sperm. Yeah. And uh, we had to carry it with us and go to a restaurant. So yeah. I walked up and they were like, how many? And I was like, three million. <laughs> <laughs> there's three million in two of us is it going to be a weight and they were like the guy's face i was like everything's fine everything's fine that's good well Table i guess we'll wrap million. it up on that note and uh that's a good place to end on <laughs> and if anybody wants to um <laughs> see your shows they're at dana goldberg.com dana goldberg.com right? if you're listening in la i'll actually be headlining the improv on um, the first wednesday of april oh my april god 5th that's exciting for gays r us Awesome. So come see me. Okay, it wonderful. It is a pleasure to see you and spend some time with you this morning. You too. Thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. And keep being funny. I'll do my best. <laughs> Everyone stay sane. All right. We'll be right back with uh, Patsy Moore. And if you had made a comment on Facebook, you'll be getting one of her books uh, to the first one that does a post. Okay, we'll be right back. The Live, Love, Thrive radio show is produced by 360karma.com. Are you a 360 Karma woman? If so, spread the word. Be sure to follow us on social media at 360 Karma Women on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please like us and share us with family and friends. This is the year of the woman, and we are stronger together. The Live, Love, Thrive program is brought to you in part by Honda of downtown Los Angeles, supporting the equality and empowerment of women. And we are back. Uh, welcome, Patsy Moore. Hi, Patsy. How are Hi, you? Hi, Catherine. Happy International Women's Day. I know. How fabulous is that? It's really fabulous. Yep. Yep. I, Got I on my love button to... in red. Yes. I yeah. forgot to do the red thing. You forgot. Um, I'm you know, I'm following so Dana Goldberg, which is a oh. little terrifying. Oh. <laughs> I have She's no a lot stories of about sperm, by the way. <laughs> None. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I think we were, were talked out on that topic. But um, thank you so much for being on today. It's been such a pleasure getting to know a little bit about your background because I didn't know a lot about it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that you were born in Antigua. I was. Yeah. Many, many years ago. I've been to Antigua. It's such a beautiful island. It's gorgeous. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful water. Beautiful. What was it like growing up there? Well, I didn't really grow up there, although I had 
Oh, few, you were just born there? I was and then, born there, yeah. and then we moved back when I was um, starting third grade, I guess. Yeah. And we stayed for another three years, and that was incredible. That was a wonderful experience. Um, I can't imagine a better way to have grown up, and we got to hang out with my grandparents all the time. And, oh, that's yeah, so awesome. it was lovely. It was yeah, lovely. you were a tight family, small but tight. We are. Yeah. We are a tight yeah, family. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, so... You traveled around the world a lot because your dad was in the military. Yeah, 21 years he spent in the Navy. Wow, wow. So what other, uh, you know, countries, cities did you guys we, reside My in? father was Navy, so yeah. we did all the usual suspect locations. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we did Norfolk, Virginia. We did Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We lived in Korea, South Korea when I was very young. Oh, my gosh. We lived in the Caribbean. Um, and many times we were stationed state stateside, and my dad was doing tours of duty right. elsewhere. So he'd be gone sometimes for close to a year. Right. The Mediterranean tour, things like that. So all of these world travels mm -hmm. tend to impact people in different ways. And for you, it sounds like it definitely impacted you in uh, the way people deal with, I think, you know, moving and meeting different people. Yours came out in music and poetry and writing songs yes yeah, yeah well I mean gosh I there's what a way to have your imagination triggered right you know I yeah. mean aside from living around the world and having that experience my family's a bit international too yeah so uh, that's a lot of color and texture that's um, influencing you you know yeah. just from day to day and Wait, was there uh, musicians songwriters poets in your family there are um, a lot of talented artists on both sides. My father's side in particular, mm -hmm. a lot of amazing singers uh, and musicians. My father has a, a beautiful singing voice. He played trumpet and French horn. Um, he was the first music teacher I had, really. He taught my sister oh. and I everything that we knew growing up about singing harmony and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your mom, uh, not so much. My mom is a big appreciator. Of music. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. I love that. I'm an appreciator. She, now I know what yeah. I am in the music world. <laughs> I, but there was always music playing in our yeah. house, always, yeah. um, and all sorts of music. Yeah. And um, yeah, so but a lot of a lot of arty types. Yeah. Well, you have worked with some very influential people. Uh, I know your career took you to Nashville. You told me you were writing music for like Luther Vandross and. I wrote with Luther. With, yeah. You wrote with Luther. Yeah. What was that like? Incredible. I mean, mostly because it aside, get any better than well, that. Well, yeah, and it? you know, the whole time you're amazing. hoping, I want him to do this cut because he's Luther. Yeah. But uh, really, the the most amazing thing about that time was just that he was such a lovely human being. That's the that's, really lovely. that's as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. You get to work with somebody amazing, and they're an awesome human being. Right? I've been fortunate. I honestly, yeah. most of my experiences with uh, in the music world and uh, and occasionally with people who were my heroes growing yeah, up yeah. have all been quite lovely. Yeah. So, And you did something with Diana Reeves? Diane Reeves yeah. has um, very yeah. graciously recorded music of mine over wow. the years and, of course, elevates it. What does that feel like when you've written a song and, and a well-known artist performs it? I mean, it must be... It's surreal. Surreal. That's what yeah. I would think. Yeah. You know, I... It, the very first time I ever attended Disney Concert Hall, yeah, um, I was in the audience hearing something I'd written. Uh, yeah, and that they, was they put five of your poems to music. Right, right? Um, Eddie I mean, De, Eddie Del Barrio, who is an amazing composer, did this master work called Misa Justa, and he contacted me and said, "Will you write the words for it?" Oh and I was really intimidated, um, uh, terrified is a better word, but I thought when else in life are you going to have a chance to collaborate with Eddie Del Barrio wow. um, on something this majestic? And so it was, it was a joy, and it expanded me in so many ways. And um, But that night, sitting in the audience, was uh, was surreal. Yeah, and not you've just had a lot of surreal moments. Hearing it all in yeah. context, but also Diane was the lead vocalist for that event as well. So yeah. that was lovely to hear her doing stuff once I, again. I know that you're an award-winning recording artist. Um, the, the awards were for which uh, um, music that you did? I've gotten award, a lot of songwriting awards over the years. Um, I collaborated on a children's Kwanzaa album that was awarded quite heavily. Um, 
Yeah, and I've written for a lot of award-winning artists. artists. So, what, what was Nashville like? Was that a cool experience? I mean, obviously, you working with Luther, but I know you worked with a lot of different people there. Nashville yeah. was uh, great. Yeah. You know? yeah, I mean, I went through my struggling artist period there, and yeah. you know, everybody was eating out of you know vats of macaroni and cheese. Yeah, and, um, starving artist. Yeah, yeah, but I had a great experience there. I, I what's was that, signed. What's that famous uh, club there? I've I've been to Nashville once, and I went to it. It's in that strip mall, and everybody. The Bluebird Cafe. The Bluebird. Oh I've sung gosh. at the Bluebird. Really? Oh my yeah. gosh, that place is so famous. It's, it's cool, it's, and it's wonderful. It's yeah. just wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, Nashville, I had the good fortune of being signed to a smaller publishing company. And so it was very much like a family. But mm -hmm. we really had that whole Brill Building experience where we would sometimes crash there for two or three days at a time writing. and yeah. having... Because when you're doing what you love, working for two no or three time. days without sleep is is. Nothing, I was also right? substantially it's... younger. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I could do that now. But yeah. That helps. But you know, it is true when you're doing something you love, it just, the time just flies. And it does. It's like, you know, that old saying, you would be doing it whether you were paid or not, but you know, but it's nice to get paid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and many of us spend more of our lifetime doing it when we're not being paid. Yes. Um, especially artists. Yeah. But, especially artists. But but yeah. I think that speaks but, to how strong the drive the, the is. The drive is, yeah. the compulsion, yeah. I, I have all the admiration in the world for artists, whether it's, uh, you know, singers, painters, the actors. Mm -hmm. uh, they really, uh, they have gifts, and it is such a struggle in those arenas, for, for most of them, not all, but, but a lot of people. It can be. It can yeah. be. But you've had an amazing career, and um, I know you also uh, have a company with Mar Hobbs where you guys create music for, like, scores for films. And we whatnot. do, yeah. yeah. We have a, a small outfit called Papa Chewy Media, uh -huh. and we do score for TV, film, commercials, games. Uh -huh. uh, and then we also uh, compose together under the name Glass Kid, um, not only doing scoring but writing songs for mm -hmm. other artists. and. Uh, Mara is uh, a brilliant musician and composer. She is, and a wonderful uh, human and being. And a wonderful human being, yeah. she is, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And is there something that you like the most? Because I know you're so eclectic. You do poetry, you do songwriting, filmmaking. I mean, you do all of these different things. Is there something that's your favorite? Whatever I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. right now it's filming. Yeah. Um, I'm working on a couple of film projects, and that is... Uh, really exciting for yeah. me but really I, whatever I relate to that yeah right yeah whatever i'm in in the moment is uh exciting and all-consuming yeah. and the my joy passion. is in the present yeah it's all right. you know I, I we talked about this before but for me it's all storytelling yes that's really what i'm doing is i'm telling right. stories right. that's what we are right. storytellers I and love that too. on any given day or in any given month uh, mm -hmm. i might be telling my story through film but yeah. i might be telling it through poetry I might be telling it through music. How wonderful, though, that you have all those outlets. It you is know, wonderful. So, some yeah, people are a good exciting. songwriter. Some people are a good filmmaker. Some people are a poet. But you're all of these things. And I, I know you were sharing with me that maybe uh, all the travel around the world helped you to, you know, pull that out of yourself, you know. It is such a wonderful thing to get to meet all different cultures and all different people and have mm -hmm. it influence you. and. You know, like you right. said, but uh, we're all more the same than we are different. Well, we are. And that's yeah. the most interesting thing about um, having a life that's rich with diversity. You celebrate these unique expressions that right. we each are. And then at the end of the day, you realize, but we're kind of all the same. Right. You know, so. Um, I think we're all the same as far as our souls. Mm hmm you know, we all want love and we all want these same things as far as our soul. The thing that's different is our our cultures and uh, the way we practice things or do things, mm -hmm. the food we eat or, the, or the, uh, the, the steps that we take every day on a daily basis, whether it be meditation or whatever it is, praying sure. or, you know. But what we need to do is uh, look past the cultural differences and see each other as, as souls. 
yeah. beyond the human being part of it. And celebrate the differences. They're wonderful. They make, celebrate they make life yeah, interesting. Doesn't it make it so interesting? That's yeah, why I've always been a city girl. You know, yeah, me I've too. lived in D.C., Miami, New York, L.A., and I love the eclecticness of the city. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. But, you know, for people that don't live in that, you know, I, I think what people don't know, they fear. And rather than fear it, it would be so wonderful for everyone to embrace it. And I don't know what uh, brings those walls down, but I do well, know. Well, artists do. A I was lot just going to say, yeah. but music and film and storytelling, uh, even like this uh, program, uh, I think this is what helps people to get to know people that they otherwise wouldn't get to know in their own circle or their own Absolutely. City. I mean, artists have been playing that role forever, yeah. right? Pulling these things out of the shadows, these things that are hidden. And then when you see them in the light, there's nothing to fear at all. Right. And often right. there's quite a bit to fall in love with. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think it's Marion Williamson that said, you know, at any given time, you're either in fear or in your place of love. That's... You cannot coexist with both. No. And so people have to determine at this tumultuous time, do they want to live in fear or do they want to live in a love space? Mm-hmm. And uh Obviously, the love space feels a whole lot better. Well, I, can't I know see any good that comes out of the fear. There isn't <laughs> None. ever, None. ever. Yeah. Um, I, you know, as a creative, uh, I I start from that place of love first. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, I create from that place, and and I believe that it informs what you do, right? Absolutely. When you show up that way. Yeah, your very essence is that. <clears throat> Oh, well, yeah. that's a lovely thing to hear. Yeah. I would hope so. I I, yeah. I, um, I spend a lot of time when I'm not creating myself, finding ways to encourage the creative in others. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that's so important, too. It is important. You it's know, very I say important. that all the time, that uh, the best way to get you you want is to help other people get what they want, because that's what... Uh, that's what creates the good karma mm-hmm. is helping other people and and when you're helping other people you know the funny thing is you think you're helping other people but actually by helping them you help yourself yeah. it's so rewarding it's you know mm-hmm. it's such an amazing feeling to help someone else uh, with their career or yeah. connection or whatever the case whatever's may be whatever's going on yeah, yeah. That's so, why we're here. That's why we're here right? I love that uh, yeah. that saying of Ram Das is we're all just walking each other home Ah, I like That's that. That's what we're doing. I hadn't heard that. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I know you had uh, some physical challenges. And so, you know, just about everybody, I think, in their lifetime at some point has some physical challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that that's been something that you've had to uh, overcome. And why don't we talk a little bit about that? Sure. I'm overcoming today, actually. Yeah. So, oh. um, yeah, you know what? It's, I'll tell you, um, I say this often, but I say it often because I feel it deeply. Mm -hmm. Um, Whatever the situation is, whatever the circumstances are that Mm -hmm. confront you, in my case, uh, medical disorders, issues, um, they you have no choice but to be informed by them. They right. impact your day-to-day. Yeah. You do have a choice, though, as to whether or not they define you. Right. And so there is a difference between being informed by something and being defined by it. Right. I make a choice every day to not be defined by things that um, would be perceived as limiting, right. uh, disordered, right. uh, problematic. Right. And, instead, and you have some pretty big challenges. I know they've you're, been a, large. you're a cancer survivor. I am a cancer survivor. And then you um, had a couple other things to do with. And I, I, I live with a, a couple of autoimmune disorders. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, fibromyalgia? Is but, atta- yeah. Right. That is attached yeah. to the lupus that I have. And uh-huh. that's a common sort yeah. of piggybacking thing right. that happens. Right. Um, but other people who are listening may have those same issues. Mm-hmm. And I think it can be very inspirational to hear how someone deals with that I think you start from a place of saying this is what it is Mm -hmm. I recognize that it's happening I but I am more than that right I uh, I heard uh, Wendy Hammers who's a wonderful local Mm -hmm. storyteller Mm -hmm. on Sunday shared that she went she was being counseled when she was going through pancreatic cancer and the counselor uh, asked her so what's going on and she said "Um, uh, I I have pancreatic cancer and she said well uh, or she said I have cancer and the counselor said well do you have cancer in your nose no do you have cancer in your foot no she goes well then you don't have cancer your pancreas 
has an incident. Oh, wow. An incidence oh, of cancer, well, but that's you a don't. Great explanation. And so, um, so it's so. In other words, not defining herself by it, right? Understanding that here's saying. a circumstance, here's a situation. Right. We will deal with it wisely. Right. We and will. you're saying don't ignore it. Take care of oh, it. Oh no. Right. Of course. Take not. care of it, but but don't let it be everything that you think about. You know, I have a friend that uh, had pancreatic cancer, and uh, actually, um, she started the local group in New York called Live, Love, Thrive, and that's where we got the name of the show. Okay. Her name's Barbara Lentini, and she started a local grassroots group for uh, people with cancer mm -hmm. because she felt like a lot of the cancer groups, they, they got to, the women together, and they would just talk negatively about the right. cancer and it, she said it was so depressing mm -hmm. so she created this group that was all about positivity about living with and surviving cancer mm -hmm. and using Reiki and meditation and sure. all these holistic uh, tools to help people get better and a lot of people are beating cancer I've had a guest on that was told they had uh, two months to live and that was 15 years ago Beverly Hyman feed who does a TED talk about it and she's amazing and a lot of people are beating cancer uh, every, every Every kind of cancer, even pancreatic. So here's the thing about yeah. Well, I yeah. was um, there was a point in my life where I was told that I might have six months. Oh my god! That was over a decade ago. Wow. So there you is. Go, girl. <laughs> here's the thing about creativity. Yeah. It extends beyond uh, artistry. Yeah. Right. We're constantly creating just yeah. with our thought life. Right. We're 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 creating uh, so much of our existence just based on the thoughts from which we proceed. And let me just interject. Those thoughts are a choice. And that's exactly what you're that's saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. And exactly. so um, I'm not at all glib about what it is to receive certain diagnoses and to deal with right. um, the physical implications of them and all of I, I recognize that I that's I, I right. live there but um, I also I can tell you experientially mm -hmm. um, that what you believe about your situation has an enormous impact on oh, yeah. how you proceed through that situation. Oh, sure. Um, you have to it be It actually able... impacts your DNA and your cells. Your cells. It, what it, you it think. absolutely controls absolutely. your cells. Absolutely. And yeah. so um, I spend my days reminding myself of the part of me that is whole and complete and um, not and just surviving but thriving, living, mm -hmm. loving, and thriving. Yes, right. and healthy. Yeah. And... Um, I cannot tell you how many times doctors have looked at me and said, I, I don't even know how you're, you know, and it's like, because this is my choice. Wow. And you have such a strong will to do the artistic things that you're doing, mm -hmm. writing your music and doing your poetry. And mm -hmm. I know you have this really cool uh, multimedia project that you're working on. Yeah. That, uh, I, I love it. I always think in life, you know, we do so many different things, but it always culminates in it something. All lands in one place. Yeah. yeah. And so that's kind of what you're doing right now mm -hmm. is you, you're, you're doing this multimedia. I think it's uh, music, film, and poetry all, uh, in all this together. Project. Yeah. It's yeah. a virtual installation. It's uh, been in the slow making for almost four years. Wow. Um, there it's is called a, The Way Back? It's called The, the way, way Home. Way, well, it's the, the full thing is called Home. Home. But there is a book that is a part of it. It's a collection of poetry and uh, impressionist stories uh -huh. that actually will begin its release a week from today. And that's called The Way Home. And that's home. called The Way Home. Right. And, and we're going to release we're that actually, early. Uh, giving away one of your books, which is um, Things I've Come to Realize yeah, in, in the, the past, past few days, days yeah. which are your social media posts, mm -hmm. which are really cool posts about life in general, your mm -hmm. priorities, your health, your relationships. Uh, wonderful book. I have it. Thank you. And we're giving it away. In fact, the first one to post was uh, Denise Kahn. Denise so Kahn. So Denise will be getting a copy of your book. Wonderful. Thank you for I shall donating sign that, that today. For Denise Kahn. Okay, great. Wonderful. We'll have to have her uh, ping us with her address and we'll send that off. Thank you for tuning in, Denise, and everyone else. Thank you. Um, so how can people find out about this virtual installation? They're going to be able to see it online and possibly, you told me, maybe in person. Uh, maybe. Yeah, there's someone who's begun speaking with me about the possibility of doing it in a small local gallery mm -hmm. uh, and then possibly even seeing if that could travel. Mm -hmm. so but it will start off online. And, and when, when do you anticipate that? When should we be looking for that? 
I think the full thing will probably be ready, if not by the end of this year, at the very top of next year. Okay. But what we're doing is releasing um, individual components of oh, it cool. to help pay yeah. for the finishing of the full oh, project. Oh, so you're still raising funds still for it. Still raising funds for it. Okay. So, um, but it does include Is a documentary on, uh, film. W- where would they find that? On GoFundMe or Indiegogo? Or where are you? Uh, we were originally on Indiegogo. Okay. Deciding now if we're going to continue doing that route or doing something that's completely of of our own making. Okay. So what would people Google to find that? It's um, home or? It's home, but you can just go to Pat, just... patsymore.com. Oh, okay, we'll, great. We'll be posting updates. The The website itself is being revamped. It should be ready right. by early summer. And you told me right now they could go to uh, book. Uh, Books.patsymore.com. Uh, right. Yeah, we'll also right. have we announcements have that up on the there. Right. Okay. We'll have announcements there as well. Awesome. Yeah. And do you have a Facebook? Uh, that you... Yeah. You know what? Yeah. So... Yeah. I have the f- official Facebook page yeah. that I honestly, yeah. true confession, almost never use. Yeah. Um, I use my personal page as my main yeah. page. So people so can look up Patsy Moore Patsy. on Facebook. Moore on okay. Facebook and, 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 and so I'm so excited to see this uh, combination, and we'll definitely look for the fundraiser to help mm-hmm. you out with that. Um, and uh, w- what else is uh, uh, on your radar or all your efforts going into that? Well, Mar and I are continuing to um, do our scoring work. Uh-huh. So if somebody has a film out there that they need a score. That, need, that needs score, please contact right. us. That's what you guys did. Yeah, you can uh, powwow at Papa Chewy Media, C-H-U-Y, uh, dot com. Cool. And, um, how, and I know we're about to wrap up, but mm-hmm. how do you score a film? You watch the film and yeah. then you decide what kind of vibe to put into well, it that, work, that's got to be yeah, fascinating it's i love it yeah because yeah, i get to marry the two things that i love the most which yeah. is film and music yeah. um you work really closely with the director sometimes yeah. the producers involved um it's it's a great exchange of creative ideas and uh it you're, you're always on that fine line between the music that's actually lifting the scene yeah. for the audience and at the same time being transparent enough that it's not overwhelming what's happening Okay. Well, we, I'm looking so forward to the film, the music, the poetry of your multimedia home. Mm-hmm. I know it's about how people uh, need home, want home, talk about search home, for it. search for home. And it's, it's sort of built thing. out of the arc of uh, a love affair and, and how we often search for home in one another. I love that. What a wonderful way for us to end our conversation. Mm-hmm. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And uh, we're going to take it home. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Keep doing the beautiful work you're doing. Thank you, Catherine. You too. Thank you. And uh, we will be back next week uh, with more wonderful guests here at noon on Wednesdays. You can also find us, of course, on YouTube. Please subscribe to us there or on iTunes. And uh, check us out on Facebook, 360 Karma Women. And we'll be back next week. Same time, same channel, UBN, 12 noon on Wednesdays. Hugs and happiness.